was about to say what I say on every call. I'm getting paid by the hour. <laughs> I'm definitely not getting paid by the hour. <laughs> so, um, well, in in line with what you were just saying, though, I think it's it's worth noting that um, every provider who got into this business made a promise, whether they whether they did it um, expressly, or overtly, or just impliedly, they made a promise to be there for everyone who calls. If you weeded out the actual calls that require nine one one to begin with you lose about 70% of your call volume. And of those 30% left over, if you weeded out the ones that weren't actually emergencies, you'd probably lose another half. So it's not about, even though emergency is in the name, that's not what it's about. This is people care. This is human care. This is the last and first line. Oh man, I hate how this is going to sound, but EMS is both the first and last line of humanity that we have left nobody else cares like the EMS providers are supposed to care. All the way from like my shift yesterday, from Mima who needs her hand held and just to be told like, she's okay. Everything's all right. You know, she fell. She doesn't want to go to the hospital, but now she's worried about her family finding out and she's going to be put in a nursing home all the way from that to the gunshot wounds i'm going to say to the head because it's kind of a hot topic right now all the way from Mima to that it is all supposed to be treated the same these are all human beings these are all people with some kind of need Indeed. and if you lose that compassion and you lose that empathy and like I say on those calls that get under my skin from the get-go, if you lose your customer service face and personnel, even when you're getting frustrated, get out the field. And I'm not sorry for saying that. Or go to the river or, you know, go for a high. I mean, there's, it's go if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. It happens to everybody. Um the 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 issue the the problem isn't going to that dark place the problem is not being able to get back out of it um if you just between you and me now if we're just talking like regular people if you try to hold yourself to a standard where you where you never burn out it's unattainable it's unrealistic and you are going to drive yourself crazy about it let yourself go crazy let yourself get burned out and then take a weekend off, go do whatever it is you do. I remember vividly, vividly when there was just one period in time where I was so burnt out. I hated everybody. There was one shift where I walked around. I put um, a triage tag around my neck, torn to black. And I hand wrote in the little you know box, don't fuck with me. Um, and Sorry, don't mess with me. Sorry, mom. Sorry, mama. <laughs> Um, and people knew and that, and even, and my partner's like, Hey dude, you need to take a break. And I did. And I went, I think I'm my, uh, some friends and I went to a wedding in Phoenix for a weekend. We left on a Friday, came back on a Sunday. I spent the whole time sitting by the pool, reading a book, just relaxing. And I felt great when I got back. I just needed a little time to unplug and get away. So for you and for everybody else, don't think you're not going to burn out. Don't think that's not going to happen because it's going to. It's how you manage it. It's it's how you are when you come back. If you come back and you're like, oh man, this is not, you know, not for me anymore, whatever, I, I'm not, I haven't recovered, then you're right. Maybe it is time to try something else. Um, but also let yourself be human. All right. And I'm not going to get extensively into it. And we'll talk about it later on, but the mental health aspect of dealing with this job. We have to get past the suck it up buttercup. And this is just part of the job, whatever. But that mental resiliency of like you're talking about when you need a break, take it. When you need to take a step back. I mean, shoot, if you want to 
pause your career in EMS to get yourself together, go ahead. Like there will be patients in the future. A little at a time, you don't need to do that. I, I don't think so. I think if if you get to the point where you need to step away from the job altogether, it's probably should be permanent. But at, before the pressure builds up, before you get to that point, take your little break, step away, find, go, go be with people that you don't talk about. Cause you know, how EMS people are, we, we get together, especially if we have a couple of drinks, if that's all we're talking about is the job, right? Go get away from them for, a, for a, even a day, even a weekend and be with people that want to talk about anything else. And it, it refreshes, it refreshes the, the battery. Um, this whole suck it up buttercup. That was my day, right? We didn't talk. We didn't have PTSD. That was for soldiers coming back from war. We didn't have that shit. But now it's okay to talk about it's okay. And believe me, I spill my guts out at the end of the book about mental health and my own struggles. And um, I wish I'd have known then and done then what I know and I'm doing now, it would have been a lot easier. So, you know, even beyond the law aspect of this, of this book, if I can help someone like you prevent getting to places where, you know, the older of us have been worth every, worth every minute, minute, every penny. Absolutely. So diving into the book. Um, yes. <clears throat> I, I talked about the why of why you wrote the book and why we should read the book why everyone should dive in, reflect, and learn, because there's so much to do, both of those, in this book. But I I admire the way, like you simplified actual legal terms and made it make sense to our profession. It wasn't just, here's this, here's breach of duty, here's negligence, the things that we hear about, but how it's applicable to understanding in the big picture in the not even just if you go to court but like your day-to-day call-to-call aspect of how these can be dissected into I I mean I don't want to say every single move that you make like like you talk about is this idea that like everybody's watching there's somebody watching at any given point even when it's you in the back with your patient, it's that mentality of like, if somebody was watching me right now, what would they say? So um, you even talk about the difference of, like we learn about in DMT school and it's harped on in paramedic school. And we hear it like, if somebody happens to go to court or anything like that, you hear about the uh, the difference of, kidnapping and good intentions and then false imprisonment and then you tie in negligence it's all these things that like I feel like when you hear about there's like a thunder and everyone kind of like freezes up because it's such a scary concept Um, I, I wanted I wanted readers to not be afraid of the things we've all been told to be afraid of to dispel the myths um that have historically stopped some providers from doing the right thing okay. so exactly and it's like i brought up it's that ability to transcribe these actual real life ems cases that you bring in the nomenclature of legalistic terminology and you break it down And you make it relatable and you read about these things that it's happened to other people. It is real life. It's not a story that's made up. It's not an anecdote that somebody heard that's that somebody else did. And they, their third cousin told them about, but it's real life stuff that you can look up. And even like, when you talk about these cases, there was one where you break down what the bystander saw then what the paramedic said then what the police said yeah even to the the point when Mm -hmm. the case went to court and the experts you know those scary people were warned about that are going to tear us apart in court 
um, like what they said in regard to where the EMS crew screwed up. And ultimately it's like reading about some of the things they were saying, even though in some of these cases, there were egregious mistakes that these providers made that like one of the cases I, I was reading to my partner at work and we both were like, are these guys serious? But at the same time, it's, it's that stomach curling feeling that I can't guarantee if I wasn't in their shoes. I, I mean, I'm not going to say I would have done the same exact thing, but it's, it's that rabbit hole of, yeah, this patient's drunk. Or if you're not hearing the whole story, like, yeah, they're probably just drunk. Oh, they've had three drinks, you know, multiply that times two. And that's how many they've had. Uh, for me, it just, the way these cases presented and then, you know, go into the regard of the experts points of the notes regarding the duty that these providers had and completely neglected. It was kind of eye-opening. And again, we're taught and it's drilled in our heads, this idea of if, you're, if your call goes to court, you're going to get ripped apart. And that's kind of what happened to these providers. And especially one of these cases, I was like, you know what? Good. They deserved it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, I mean, and that I, I don't disagree, depending on which cases you're talking about. Um, but this happens every day. It's happening as you and I are talking right now, it's happening out there. People are making these kinds of mistakes that in the, in retrospect, you look at and go, oh man, I never would have done that in a million years. It's terrible. But in the moment you're like, oh shit, I'm, I might very well have done the exact same thing or from one call to the next. This is the only business that I can think of where at the beginning of every shift, you throw your your cert or your license on the table and you dare the world to take it away from you that day. Because I think this is the only only job in civilian life anyway that I can think of where one little twist of unpredictable fate could cost you absolutely everything. That's why only certain types of people can do this particular job. And kind of like you also brought up, even your frequent flyers your people that you know their social security number by heart because mm -hmm. you pick them up so many times you know their medical history better than their old family like i heard one time and like you bring it up in the book when you get complacent and it's just another chest pain is you know when you push on, when you press on their chest, it hurts worse. So it's got to be muscular. And then you get lazy and you don't do a 12 lead and you tell them it's the same thing that you call for every week. That's going to be what takes your license. Yep. It may not be because you gave the wrong medication or because you missed one part of an assessment and the ER found that when they lifted the patient's stomach up in that car wreck, there was bruising. Like that may not be the thing. It's going to be those frequent flyers that you get, like we talk about, you get complacent and you just miss something. And that's going to be the MI and your patient and that patient's going to drop dead in an hour. And your report is going to be pulled up and it's going to show you did not do a 12 lead. That's right. That, that's that, that you know every every legal entanglement any provider can find themselves in is pretty much preventable but only on the call only in the moment only right there and then once that moment is gone so is any opportunity for you to um prevent or mitigate a legal entanglement and not all legal entanglements are created equal, right? The idea that you're going to get sued 
is is pretty remote. It's it's pretty rare. Um, but the idea that you're going to end up in court as a witness is almost a hundred percent if you're in this business long enough. And the damage to your reputation when that when that narrative gets put up on the screen is the same. So don't don't worry about getting sued, right? Worry about providing proper care. That's the number one best way to avoid any legal problems. To quote what you wrote, because I feel like you said it best. <clears throat> Me too. Do it. Me too. I feel like I said it best. But what did I say? <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you say the best, the easiest part is this. If you just do your job the way you're supposed to, the way you promise you would when you accept, sorry, the way you promise you would when you accepted it, the law will always be on your side. If you don't, well, you can't throw your bottle on the floor and cry because you don't have it. And like you talk in your book, it's not that your case will be, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not that your case is going to be brought up and it's going to be this whole huge thing and it's because of one little thing that you did but it, the experts are going to come in and they're going to bring up how you had a duty to act you have a duty to reckon like you said at one point th i think one of the cases the experts brought up like the paramedic is not just supposed to look at a patient do an assessment and call it a day whatever but it's the idea of thinking those not just three or four but like five steps ahead and being able right. to understand that because there's the shortness of breath and this and that whatever it's more than just giving oxygen calling a day but understanding the oh, what's the word i'm looking for um the long-term possibilities? Long-term possibilities, but like creating that overall differential diagnosis more or less, even though we can't diagnose in the field, whatever. Um, here's, here's, what I, here's what I would say, and I say this to every group, there's two things that, that every provider needs to accept. Number one, we are the least mature members of society. Even as a lawyer now, I am among the least mature members of society. But in the moment, the EMS provider on the call, no matter what the call is, they got to be the grownups in the room, right? If not, there are, there are no others. And the second thing is, I tell groups, I say playfully, that everybody who isn't us is stupid. And what that means is, they don't know what they don't know, and we have to know it for them. We as EMS providers, you as EMS providers, have to know it for them. So you've got to be the grown-ups in the room, and you've got to be able to see not just what happened, but what the possible results are of the mechanism of injury and the, and the potential. And I know you're feeling great now. You just had a car accident. The adrenaline's rushing through. But in 15 minutes, you're not going to feel so hot, right? You have to be the one that knows that they don't know what they don't know and act on it and be able to act on it and don't just leave because they said they wanted you to go. Because that's yeah. another huge problem. <clears throat> um, personal anecdote. And I'm going to say kind of like a, not necessarily a wake-up call, but... um something that kind of felt like jolted me a little bit personally i'm not a fan of refusals unless it is something that you know hands down without a doubt but at the same time you don't know for sure something that either the patient can drive themselves to the hospital for something that's not i don't want to say not an emergency but like Let's go off on another small tangent. Somebody called 911 because they feel like they have the flu. They went to the doctor yesterday. They were diagnosed with XYZ flu. 
they were prescribed antibiotics. They started their antibiotics today and they don't feel good. Offer to take them to the hospital, but like, I don't think there's any harm in explaining like, you just started your antibiotics. However, there could be something else going on. We should bring them to the hospital. Anyways. Um, well, I think advocating, being a patient advocate first and foremost, doesn't necessarily dictate how a call ends. It does though dictate how a call, how you approach it, right? Yeah, it doesn't sound like that person needs to go to the hospital, at least not by ambulance, but you offer anyway, because as your lawyer, uh, I want to be able to tell everybody that, hey, at least you offer, right? Refusals are a reality. I don't like them any more than, than, than you do, it doesn't sound like. But people are allowed to make bad decisions, right? That's just, welcome to America, look at the news, we're allowed to make bad decisions. Um, the reality, though, is that a refusal is not a refusal until, number one, it's informed. And not until the provider has done everything policy, protocol, procedure required. At that point, once you've done everything there is to do in the interest of, of what's right for that patient, then, then you're good. Then the rest is going to be what it's going to be. But until you've done those things, this is on you. Right. And that personal anecdote. Um had a lady who called for I think it was nausea vomiting we get there she's explaining what's going on she's been in the sun all day she just doesn't feel good she's throwing up her chest pain is burning it starts in like the middle of her chest goes up to her esophagus After and vomiting, it's making her so throw weird. up yeah and like you said, after vomiting, that's part of it. So we offered, do you want to go to the hospital? She's like, ah, oh, I don't know. What do you think? And so then it's the broad overarching, like, well, it could be this. It could be that. I, you know, there's only so much we can see. Why don't we go ahead and take you? So we help this woman into that's the bathroom the because. Answer, that was the correct answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. We helped this woman to the bathroom because she had to go very tactfully saying, and outside of the bathroom, me and my partner are talking and she's like, are we getting a refusal on this? We should, we get, you know, we, I don't think this really needs the hospital. And I told her, I was like, we could, I don't, I don't have a good feeling about it. There's just something there. I just, I don't feel right leaving her here. We are in the middle of nowhere. If something happens, we have to come back out here. It just, there's no point in not going ahead and taking her. Check her vital signs on the way to the hospital. Everything's fine. Nothing's getting better, but nothing's getting worse. We are 10 minutes from the hospital. And I I do like I do every call with a 12 lead. I just take another one. Why not? I'm already here. I'm already stuck with this patient in the back. Nine times out of 10, my report's 80% done. I ain't got nothing else to do. Totally. <laughs> so ran it. And it's a whole inferior stimmy. And I remember looking at the 12 lead and I'm like, no, another 12 lead. And I, I, it's the same thing. <laughs> so tell your this is on my part. Step it up. There was another one. <laughs> yeah. So at 12 lead number three, I call this freestanding ER and I'm like, hey, uh, uh, we're coming in with this patient. It, it, it's a funky for them. I think bad things are happening. And they're like, if you think it's funky, go to another hospital. I was like, okay, thanks. And in Louisiana, we have what's called LEARN, Louisiana Emergency Resource Network, whatever it is. I just know it's LEARN and I call it for trauma, stroke, or STEMI. And so I called him and the guy got a little, what's the word I want to use? Um, Saucy? Short with me. 
And he was like, well, you're coming from this city. Like the other hospital would have been more appropriate and closer. I was like, well, that's cute. When we were coming from the city that we picked her up from, we weren't dealing with the STEMI, my guy, neither here nor there. So I go, I find out what hospital to go to. And I go to the front and I'm like, Hey partner, um, we're diverting. And like, anytime I divert, she's like, Oh God, what's going on? Um, cause it, bad things are happening. And she's like, what's going on? I'm like, um, she might be having a heart attack. And she looked at me. She's like, what did you do? I said, I, I didn't do nothing. I asked her about her kids. <laughs> so, um, and just, it, it's that thing of like, even if you don't have, oh, how do I put this? Even if you feel like there's no reason to bring this person to the hospital, there's no reason they can't drive themselves. At least you're offering. And nine times out of 10 on calls that I'm about to get a refusal on, I just tell them like, hey, it's that thing, like I just said, it just, it, it comes out because it's embedded in my brain. Hey, so everything's looking good. It could be X, Y, Z. It could be this. However, comma, it could be something else entirely we can't see because we can only see blah, blah, blah. I think we, I think it's a good idea for you to go to the hospital. Do you want to come with us? Nine times out of 10, they're going to say, yeah. I mean, heck, they already called you to come there. So why not just do your job and bring them to the hospital? Anyways. Well, that's, you know, that we agree on that, but, you know, there are, there are enough providers out there that don't think that way that, you know, I wrote a book. It's a good one. <laughs> so we've talked about a lot of things, all of which are covered in David Gibbett's book, Sirens, Lights, and Lawyers. I cannot recommend it enough. I've talked about it enough and read about enough of it with my partner that she's reading it next. Absolutely. And I, I'm advertising it to anybody and everybody. I'm a personal huge fan. But more than that, it is something that if you're getting into the field, if you're already in the field, I would even say if like you're considering leaving the field, something that needs to be read. Some, like this is information that everybody can glean from. So, um, David, that's, I feel like I should say Mr. David, but David, that's all I got. Um, if you want to add in anything. Um, no, thank you for, I love talking about it. So, you know, thank you for letting me talk about it. And if anybody's got questions that they want answered from me, I'm not hard to find. If you just type my name into any search engine. There's 50 ways you can find me. Um, all I can say is just be safe and be smart and have fun. And, you know, this is a, this is the best job there is, I think. And I'm a lawyer. 100%. Yeah. Um, it's like I tell my partners so often, we have the wildest job. Like we, we drive around, we listen to music, we go to strangers' houses, bring them to the hospital, get to know them on a very, very personal level. It's a wild job. And yes, things are way different. Um, people, I'm not going to get into the rant. And the things that people sue for and come after your license for are ridiculous. But if you take what you can learn in this book, I'm not going to say you don't have anything to be scared of. There's a healthy You'll amount of fear that should be implemented, but it is no longer this doom and gloom. Always watch your back because somebody's going to come after you. Whereas that might be true. Whereas that is a possibility. If you do 
what Mr. David Givett says and you reflect on what he says, you're good, homie. No uh, imagine information as a shark cage, right? You have the information and if you apply it, then that shark can swim around you all he wants, have a real hard time getting in and you'll be protected. You'll be safe, safer. Perfect analogy. <laughs> I've been working so, on it for, for what, uh, 30 something years? Something like that. <laughs> So, David, it wasn't just a pleasure. It was an honor. I'm Thank a huge you. fan. And um, I don't know if anybody else is going to have it. I have a personalized signed copy. So you do. There's not that many of them out there. <laughs> don't worry. I'll save the signature. And one day when it gets big, I got you. Let's hope from your mouth to God's ears. So, David, if that's all you got, that's, that's all I got. And we'll wrap Let me it know, up shoot, like we shoot do. Shoot me an email or a text. Let me know when it's out. I want to listen to it. Hear my oh, dumb absolutely. comments, of whatever I said. Um, oh. So, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, email me on the podcast. It's easy. Like the sign says, 22 at the lips podcast at gmail.com. Um, if you want to go find David Givett, go ahead, ask some questions. He's pretty much not scared of anything that I've asked him. Mm -mm. <laughs> so he's got a little I'm bit of education with him. Stuff anymore. <laughs> but David, if that's all you got, that's all I got. And like we end every episode. So with that. The 22 at the Lips podcast is designed to support, not replace the relationship that exists between a practitioner and his or her medical director. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host, guest, and not necessarily of Master of Medics. The information provided during this podcast is intended for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for your approved protocols.